Welcome to the New School at Commonweal. We have a series of presentations and programs and dialogues on all sorts of hot topics. And the topic today is one in a series that we've had on things related to drugs, use and abuse. Um, it's been named for many years the uh, number one public health issue in terms of impact in the United States. Even the AMA agreed on that about 20 years ago. And as I'm sure you know, in recent years, the issue of opioid abuse has really brought it up into the public eye again <coughs> with uh, even uh, people in the uh, White House talking about it. I'm not going to say his name. But, um, <laughs> and a huge bill passed recently to try to address it with funding, finally. Um, but this is obviously a long-term issue related to all kinds of substances. So... Very pleased today to have an uh, old dear friend and colleague, Dr. Marsha Rosenbaum here, who has worked on this from a number of angles for a long time. Mm -hmm. And we, going back 20 years now, starting uh, put on some major conferences with many hundreds of people in San Francisco on different topics, and we'll probably touch on some of those as well. So mm -hmm. what I'd like to start with, just to get in terms of background for Marsha here, is to ask... Basically, what's a nice girl like you doing uh, immersed in the drug epidemic? How did you first get into this issue? Um, well, let me, let me start by letting you all know. First off, thank you for coming out for this. So how I got into drugs. What's, you know, really, what's, what's a nice Jewish girl from Atherton doing in, interested in drugs, and um, it, it what it goes back to is, and this is the disappointing thing for so many people when I talk about this. It wasn't personal; it was just not personal. I was um, at the time uh, getting a PhD in sociology uh, from UCSF in. in um, with an emphasis in medical sociology. It was US, UCSF, after all. And um, just became involved in somebody's research study, in a, a, a friend's research study of heroin addicts. And a big study, 5,000 of them. And my part of this research was women. The women in the study, there were probably 500 of them. And um, as a sociologist, all I was doing was analyzing data. Um, but then I ended up making a presentation to the uh, sociology convention, and there was a woman there who worked for the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and she says, Gee, I mean, remember, this is 1977. We don't have any research on women heroin addicts. Uh, you want to do something? And I said, sure. So I applied for a grant from the government, got a nice grant, and here I was. I just landed in this lucky situation where um, I'm doing my PhD and I have funding from the government. I have a staff and perfect. And the research was about women heroin addicts. That's how I got into drugs. It was just research. But in the course of that research study, and, um, and then several others that followed, um, I looked up methadone maintenance and crack cocaine and um, um, uh, other for women who were pregnant and using drugs. And in the middle of this research, the really good fortune, really good fortune, of getting a grant, it was the first federally funded sociological study of a drug hardly anyone had heard of then, 1987, called MDMA, ah. ecstasy. And so just imagine, I'm doing all of this research and it's, um, you know, a, a people who are struggling and having difficulty and they have an opioid issue and they're going to jail. And right in the middle of it, I'm now I'm interviewing 100 people who use MDMA. And they don't have any problems. And so that was my main interest in my research background. That's what I was doing. I was a sociologist. Um, 
But right along in there around 1988, um, my daughter, um, who was in fifth grade at the time, came home and announced to me that she now, mom, I know everything there is to know about drugs. And um, you know this child, she's, now she's 40, but uh, very precocious, very precocious. And, and uh, now I am paying attention. The issue of teenagers and drug use, I just, it, it just didn't come across for me until that moment. As I say, pause for a minute. So Annie, um, how do you know everything there is to know about drugs? She says, because mom, I am a graduate of the D.A.R.E. program. D.A.R.E. program, Drug Abuse Resistance Education. Maybe you've heard of this program. Um, and maybe, well, some of you may have gone through it. Um, uh, it didn't exist, thank God, when I was in high school. But um, so the D.A.R.E. program, which I have to say is kind of surprising to me because um, I didn't know they were having the D.A.R.E. program at her elementary school. And what was surprising about it was that every other extracurricular activity that they ever had, including the most you know, mundane things, like we're going across the street to the park, is that okay? I sign a permission slip, right? I hear nothing about this. So um, then I, I say to her, I'm kind of holding my breath, I say, so like, what did you learn? And she says, well, mom, you may not know this, but remember, I, you know, I have a PhD in this stuff. Mom, you may not know this, but. Um, and then she, so I love to use this illustration. It's very low tech illustration. So, you know, okay. Um, she, we had a chalkboard in the kitchen. So she draws a, a big circle on the chalkboard. She says, now mom, that is your brain. I said, okay. And then she draws little circles inside the big circle and says, these are your brain cells. And then she takes the eraser and she erases half of this big circle and says, Mom, when a person smokes marijuana, half of their brain cells are erased forever. So I thought, okay, um, didn't quite know what to do with that little item of, inf of misinformation, but it became interested in what our government was telling kids about drugs. Um, I knew that drug education or drug prevention was um, part of a, a constellation of, of programs and activities, all in the name of um, the war on drugs, winning the war on drugs, which you know, for me <coughs> yesterday was a deja vu, right? So now, now we have Trump reinvigorating the old war on drugs, which we already know failed, but okay. Shouldn't, that shouldn't be a surprise. But so, um, so drug education, what, what was it? What, what did it look like? And I, then I really was curious about it. And um, basically what the, what the message was at that time, and it, it, it pretty much remains, is don't do that. Um, it, with all kinds of... Um, tools to back up that admonition. Um, there was uh, a lot of misinformation, like, the, like the, the brain with the circles. And all of you, I, kn I know you were aware, and because we all couldn't, you couldn't miss it. Um, there was the egg in the frying pan. That's the classic one. Um, this is your brain on drugs. This is your brain, and then they crack the egg, and then you, it's the fried egg commercial. And um, I, at the time, I, there was a poster, 
And I happened to pick up one of those posters. I still have it. And now I think it might be really valuable, this, the fried egg commercial. But there was that. And then there were all kinds of um, punishments that were devised um, for kids if you got caught. Um, and so that was basically what drug education was. Don't do it. And if you do, this is what's going to happen to you. The physiological stuff about, you, you know, your brain cells. And also, they, they were punishing kids. And um, random drug testing was also a component in some places of this, too. Um, and so I, that's what drug education was. I just thought, no, 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 no. Because what I believed and still do is... I mean, I liked, I would have, I, let, let me put it this way. I would have liked abstinence. I would have liked for my kids to abstain. That would have been ideal. I abstain from drugs, abstain from sex until they're, you know, 25 or something <laughs> like that. But um, that, that would have been my preference. However, um, my kids were growing up in San Francisco, um, not very far from the hate, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's all San Francisco. And I'm, I think, here too. And so really, was abstinence going to just do the trick? Could I just advocate for abstinence and expect that that was going to happen? I didn't think so. So, um, I, you know, I thought all right, what I need is, since I knew the schools weren't providing it, I needed, if I couldn't have abstinence, what then is my plan B? What, what's the fallback if you can't, if your kids aren't, aren't abstinent? And um, for me, it was real clear, and it was clear in one word, and that was safety. I, I wanted my kids to be safe. And so, so then what do you do? And so at that time, um, what I tried to do was, well, the, fir the first thing was that I had gone to um, a San Francisco Chronicle um, editorial board meeting with a couple of colleagues. And what we were talking to the Chronicle about, not, I shouldn't say we, because it wasn't me, it was me, it was, um, this uh, one particular person was laying out to the Chronicle all about the value of, instead of thinking about the war on drugs um, in terms of the solution, to take a public health approach to the drug issue. And particularly with the words harm reduction, which you have you heard these words before, harm reduction. And... Um, plays out why harm reduction is the best approach. If you can't have abstinence, at least you can reduce the harms that can, that can accompany drug use. So um, harm reduction, okay. So the, one of the men on the editorial board of the Chronicle, he says, um, since I was the only woman there, he just, uh, and, and, it wasn't just because I was a woman, his son and my son played soccer together. They're 14 years old. And he says to me, okay, that's all fine and dandy, this harm reduction thing for adults, but what do you say to the kids? What do you say? And so I told him my harm reduction approach to, to teenagers. And he says to me, um, he says, well, if you, if you will write this as a letter to your son, um, I will run it as an op-ed in the Chronicle. Wow. And the, this is perf your perfect timing. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so I, that's why I wanted you to put down the booklets because it's th this letter is in there. But I, I, I just want to read it because it, 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 it lays out the perspective of you know, how to talk to kids about drugs. I think better than, you know, better than anything I could just say. 
So this is the piece I wrote for the Chronicle, which um, they ran. And it's to my son, and um, his name is Johnny, really, really Johnny. Um, Dear Johnny, this fall you will be entering high school, and like most American teenagers, you'll have to navigate drugs. As most parents, I would prefer that you not use drugs. However, I realize that despite my wishes, you might experiment. I will not use scare tactics to deter you. Instead, having spent the past 25 years researching drug use, abuse, and policy, I will tell you a little bit about what I have learned, hoping this will lead you to make wise choices. My only concern is your health and safety. When people talk about drugs, they are generally referring to illegal substances, such as marijuana, cocaine, methamphetamine, psychedelic drugs, ecstasy, and heroin. These are not the only drugs that make you high. At alcohol, cigarettes, and many other substances like glue cause intoxication of some sort. The fact that one drug or another is illegal does not mean one is better or worse for you. All of them temporarily change the way you perceive things and the way you think. Some people will tell you that drugs feel good and that's why they use them. But drugs are not always fun. Cocaine and methamphetamine speed up your heart. LSD can make you feel disoriented. Alcohol intoxication impairs driving. Cigarette smoking leads to addiction and sometimes lung cancer. And people sometimes die suddenly from taking heroin. Marijuana does not often lead to physical dependence or overdose, but it does alter the way people think, behave, and react. I've tried to give you a short description of the drugs you might encounter. I chose not to try to scare you by distorting information because I want you to have confidence in what I tell you. Although I won't lie to you about their effects, there are many reasons for a person your age not to use drugs or alcohol. First, being high on marijuana or any other drug often interferes with normal life. It is difficult to retain information while high, so using it, especially daily, affects your ability to learn. I'm skipping a little bit. Um, If you might try marijuana, please wait until you are older. Adults with drug problems often started using at a very early age. Finally, your father and I don't want you to get into trouble. Drug and alcohol use is illegal for you, and the consequences of being caught are huge. And a lot of consequences listed there. And here's where I stop sounding like Nancy Reagan, this part. Otherwise, sounds just like her, doesn't it? All the reasons not to. Despite my advice to abstain, you may one day choose to experiment. I will say again, this is not a good idea. But if you do, I urge you to learn as much as you can and use common sense. Um, If you are offered drugs, be cautious. Watch how people behave, but understand that everyone responds differently, even to the same substance. If you do decide to experiment, be sure you are surrounded by people you can count upon. Plan your transportation, and under no circumstances, drive or get into a car with anyone else who has been using alcohol or other drugs. Call us or any of our close friends anytime, day or night, and we will pick you up, no questions asked, and no consequences. And please, Johnny, use moderation. It is impossible to know what is contained in illegal drugs because they are not regulated. The majority of fatal overdoses occur because young people do not know the strength of the drugs they consume or how they combine with other drugs. Please do not participate in drinking contests, which have killed too many young people. Whereas marijuana by itself is not fatal, 
Too much can cause you to become disoriented and sometimes paranoid. And of course, smoking can hurt your lungs later in life and now. Johnny, as your father and I have always told you about a range of activities, including sex, think about the consequences of your actions before you act. Drugs are no different. Be skeptical, and most of all, be safe. Love, Mom. Mm -hmm. So that was my message to my 14-year-old son at that time, and um, it's still completely relevant, completely relevant. Um, so I write this letter, and it gets in the Chronicle. Okay. So you know, I had read the letter to Johnny before I sent it in. I said, do you understand this? I, I'm supposed to be writing to a 14-year-old. Do you understand it? He, and he just, you know, at 14, I, no offense to you guys because you're close to 14 or maybe a little older than 14. But anyway, uh, he, he wasn't that interested in what I was doing or what I was saying. But he said, I understand. I get it. I get it, Mom. Okay. So um, then it runs in the Chronicle and it had my email on it. And um, I start getting emails and my phone starts ringing and his phone starts ringing too and he comes running into me mom what did you do and I said I told you this was going in the chronicle and he says oh my god he said I'm just so embarrassed and but the, it, it, that wasn't my point is was to not to embarrass him but what happened was that I got a lot of um, requests from people saying, I quietly have this perspective. Other parents had this perspective. They, and you may have as well, those of you who have had kids, um, but I don't dare say it out loud. Don't dare go beyond abstinence. And um, so I, uh, what else do you have to say? And so I, I wrote, uh, the first, this is the sixth or seventh edition of this booklet, but I, I, I wrote a booklet with the letter in it and which laid out the perspective um, of, of how I think drug education should be. And I wanted to get this information out to the, as many parents as I could. So, and I was working at that time at the Drug Policy Alliance in San Francisco. And so I thought, what is, what is the largest, I thought, I'll, go, I'll just go big here. What's the largest parent organization that I could think of? And here's what it is. The largest parent organization in the world is the National PTA here in the United States. The second largest parent organization with a million members, National has five million. The second largest million members is here in California, California State PTA, huge. And I thought, let's go, let's go with the PTA then, <laughs> shall we? So um, that's what happened. I hired a consultant and um, began basically auditioning to the, to the California State PTA. A lot of people were very skeptical, and they still are. People get very nervous if, you, if you're taking a perspective that, that veers off of just say no, because that continues to be the, and I mean just say N-O, not the, the new just say K-N-O-W, which you see everywhere now. Everyone uses that one. Um, and so um, finally, because of uh, some of the leadership in the PTA, they began to distribute this booklet all across the state of California. And um, it was a big breakthrough. So uh, that's basically the parent education that I was focusing on. But what was missing and what I heard from educators and parents too, but a lot of educators is, okay, what, is, what kind of curriculum do you have then? What, what about schools? What are they supposed to use 
if they don't use DARE. And so in the last couple of years, what we've done at, at Drug Policy Alliance is to actually create a, um, a curriculum for, and starting in ninth grade, um, it was designed by us with the content and um, educators who, who actually know how to create a curriculum. And this I had no idea about, about what it means to have a, a curriculum. Um, my, my concept of education was kind of didactic, but you're not doing didactic with ninth graders. That does not work. So um, we did create a program, a curriculum, and in this curriculum, we take not only the major categories of drugs that they might encounter, which you know what they are. They're, they're the depressants, like alcohol. They're, um, they're the stimulant family of drugs, which includes speed. But it, it also, when you're talking about the stimulants, you, you got to go, the, you, you know, you have to get out of the mindset of legal, illegal. And all you need to do is go to any supermarket. There is, this shocked me when I first actually saw this. There's whole shelves full of Red Bull and other kinds of drinks um, that are stimulants. They are, and basically what they are is speed. Um, so that category of drugs, we also, um, course cover marijuana extensively in there, and um, psychedelics. But also part of this curriculum, because we thought it was important for, for young people to understand the context of the world they're living in, in terms of, in terms of drugs. Um, and, and that was always you know, part of my thinking too. Um, or part of my questions and curiosity is, oh my God, we have tried to get these kids to abstain. We have tried, we've, national campaigns, we, we, we've done it. Why, why are they not, why aren't they listening um, to these messages? And of course, they're, 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 some, of the, some of them are listening. Uh, my son-in-law listened. I mean, he's a, he's a dare guy. Okay. Um, but so many of them are not. And I have the, the, the data here in case anyone wants to come up later and talk about it. But um, a, a lot of kids are using substances, mostly alcohol and, um, and now marijuana is, is second. And of course, vaping, the jewels. Um, that's so, but, um, so they continue to use. And if, if you ask yourself why they're using it, it, it's, it, it's not all that mysterious. For one thing, they live here. They live in America and America is a drug culture. You know, we, we know this. We use drugs for all, if you, if you think of a drug as any substance that changes the way you think and feel and perceive the world, and you include the legal substances along with it. We use drugs for so many things. Um, we get up in the morning, we have our, this one, the caffeine, which, you know, God help me if they ever made that illegal. Um, but. So there's, there's the coffee and then there's alcohol, you know, what do you, let's celebrate. Let's kick back and have a cold one. Um, and then there's, then there's the, uh, the, we have an epidemic also in this country of insomnia. So there's all the sleeping aids. So anyway, it, it just to, to put it kind of in a nutshell, kids live here too, and they see what we do. And so it, it it's not a mystery that they, they too would, and how many of them or their, or their classmates are prescribed um, the, the drugs, the focus drugs like Ritalin or Adderall. So, so there's that. Um, also, so, oh my God, this stuff is so risky. 
It's very risky. You tell that to a 15-year-old boy. Risky? Really? Really? What? Well, bring it on. Um, you know, th that's the, the risk argument I never thought was, was going to be effective. So, so they do. But I, I believe that kids are smart. And, I, and I, what I don't believe is that they're looking to compromise their health. They're not. So, so that's why what I'm, what I'm talking about and working on is drug education that's real education. What do these substances, how do they work? So we have lots of lessons. We have how do drugs work? How, how do drugs actually impact your brain? And I know Diana's been looking at this for a while now. Um, and uh, what, what are the issues around it? What does it mean? What are the long-term issues? Yeah. What, are these, what do these drugs do to your body and your brain? And also, what we wanted to do, which no other programs do, we wanted kids to know what to do if there's an emergency. Mm -hmm. If they think that there is something off here, um, either um, for themselves or for their friends. And mostly this happens in the context of alcohol, um, where they, they, kids, they you drink too much, pass out on their back, and if too many kids have died by asphyxiating on their own vomit mm -hmm. because their friends don't know what to do they're scared. They, they worry about getting in trouble themselves. And what they don't know, it's the simplest thing. It's, and we teach that in the curriculum, the recovery position. You never leave a kid or anybody passed out on their back. You turn them over and put them. And the other thing is um, that more and more there's acknowledgement that um, people who are anybody, the Good Samaritan laws, anybody who's helping someone who is in trouble with drugs should be, uh, should, should not be vulnerable to um, arrest, prosecution, and that. So um, too many, just too many kids have, have died because their friends didn't know what to do and they ran away. Or they drove them to the hospital and dumped them on the sidewalk. Uh, it, I don't mean to sound alarmist, but it's, it happens. So that's the kind of drug education we're doing, and we're advocating it. We, um, we piloted this pro program in New York City and about to pilot it in San Francisco. And um, I think it's going to be um, the replacement for D.A.R.E. And so that, that is basically what I'm working on and what I'm advocating. Mm -hmm. So you're basically starting from the assumption, or the knowledge, not the assumption, the experience, or you're looking at this, is that a certain number of kids are going to use, are going to experiment, as the term is anyway, and through at least modern history with drug education, D.A.R.E. and other efforts, there's really no correlation between what programs have been used and how much use there is. So when these go on, dr drug use of different drugs, you can chart them through the decades, they go up and down a little bit. So I mean, it doesn't seem to matter what we say or do about it. So we mm -hmm. try to find something that works. Now, part of the issue is that programs like D.A.R.E. are big business. Mm -hmm. They're in the schools. They, the school districts pay them a lot of money. So you've had a lot of pushback through the years. I remember in our earlier years talking about this where PTAs and schools themselves just didn't want to hear it from you and even had attacks where people would say, this is facilitating drug use, we have to be moralistic, et cetera, et cetera. Enabling. Enabling, Enabling. Yeah. yeah. But but again, the evidence is, is that doing that, the scared straight approach, which is the, the basis for D.A.R.E. really, um, doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So when you, you've, and we've had, we have long running pushback from certain organizations as well that we've known of since we started this that are really focused on mostly focused on marijuana. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd say that part of that um, goes back to what has been referred to as the gateway theory. Mm. 
and that people think if you're going to use something like usually marijuana, it will lead you to harder drugs. Mm -hmm. So just gateway theory in general, what is your take on that in terms of the evidence? Well, there's uh, there's these national surveys, which I, I happen to love them, but um, the Monitoring the Future survey and then there's a household survey. And when you look at them and you ask people who used marijuana, long-term, short-term, either way, if they've used any other drugs, the overwhelming answer is no. So uh, some people think of marijuana as not a gateway, but as almost a terminus. It's, it's, that's pretty much it. So, so the gateway has been refuted. Now, I, I, there's a new debate, which you and I have talked about. Um, do you, do you, have you heard of these um, e- e-cigarettes? Mm-hmm. Okay, and then there's one particular brand. that Jewels. 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 Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the, uh, the argument from the uh, e-cigarette industry right. is that, that they're, they're, they help people who smoke cigarettes to stop smoking. Mm-hmm. Um, but the argument, and this may well be true, this may be true, um, but, the, but the, the question about kids who don't already use cigarettes and they are, they're juuling, because that's what it's called, juuling. Does, is that, is the juuling actually ultimately a gateway to cigarette smoking? Are these cigarettes primarily nicotine? Yes, they're primarily nicotine, which of course is the addictive component in cigarettes. Mm-hmm. So, um, and actually I should have printed it out, I could have done so. I, I did a, co-authored an op-ed in the Moran IJ just a couple weeks ago about this because San Francisco banned the flavoring that is put into e-cigs, which is targeted, it's demonstrable, it's targeted at young people as a way to get them to start on these. And now we're trying to get this into Marin as well, um, the same policy. So it's a fascinating debate because it, as Marcia says, the argument is that this is used for harm reduction for tobacco smoking. Um, Interestingly enough, the big tobacco companies have bought most of the major e-cig companies now, which mm-hmm. tells you a lot about, you know, is this what they're really, they're using this as, as I see it, training wheels for smoking. Um, and as you say, it does work for some people who have cut down or even quit tobacco smoking. But those are generally adults who have been smokers for a long time. The major use of this now, much bigger and growing continually, is among young people who have never smoked tobacco. Mm-hmm. So obviously they aren't using it to quit smoking. So mm-hmm. this is um, it's very interesting because it, that also leads to one of the, about the gateway, as I've always felt that uh, tobacco is probably a stronger gateway uh, than cannabis even for other drugs. It's, that's what they link when they ask people, what did you use first? Most people were tobacco. Now that's changing because Tobacco use has been continually on the decline for quite Mm -hmm. some time. It's Mm -hmm. one of the great success stories of public health, and there's a lot of reasons for it. In San Francisco, we've got it down to 10%. Marin, it's something like that, too. And there's a lot of uh, the guru of the stand glance at UCSF says, if you can get down to 10%, you can maybe even get it to topple and go way, way down to nothing. But... Mm -hmm. Um, and it's become largely a phenomenon of lower socioeconomic class. So it's hard to pitch this as being really cool to, to other people. So it's very interesting. But the, the e-cig thing, I think, is definitely, um, it's a big threat in terms of this, in terms of bringing back tobacco. And it's certainly cool. Actually, a young woman, a high school student in Marin over the hill here, did a little video on this about five minutes about how many of her friends are doing it and what it's all about and what they think interviewing them. You know, do you think it's safe? Do you think it's... So the evidence is still coming in, but it, as it grows every six months, if you examine the evidence on the safety of e-cigs itself and the gateway theory for them, it looks worse and worse. Mm-hmm. Um, they mm-hmm. just got them in before any regulations out. But um, one thing, well, a couple of things. So one thing you alluded to was delaying use, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? 
Um, this has been a principle in sex education for many years too. Is you know, the longer you can wait, the less likely you're to have harms. And then when you mm-hmm. do start, if you do, be safe about it, right? Yeah. Um, part of that, which has come in with the cannabis debate, which you have been very involved in too, is the theories of brain development mm-hmm. and do you impact your actual brain development by using a lot when you're young? Mm-hmm. So. Marsha and I were both on Gavin Newsom's state panel on cannabis policy that was helping to guide the legalization. We were both both basically pro-legalization as a harm reduction method, really, because why put people in prison system because of using cannabis? Mm-hmm. But there, were de- there was a lot of debate in that panel and otherwise about how strong is the impact of, say, cannabis and maybe other drugs on brain development growing up and mm-hmm. how much is that a harm? Yeah. You know? Well... It's it's a debate, but I think um, there's there's some evidence that <clears throat> using cannabis too much, too often, too young um, is, and we're not sure that it's it has a permanent, um, you know, any kind of permanent impact on the brain. But it, it certainly has some impact on just kind of social development. Um, so that's, that's the delay argument. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the problem with the, 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 the brain argument, and you and I have argued about the brain stuff too, mm-hmm. is um, that it's, it, it has become the trump card of people who oppose legalization, um, who oppose reform, and it's, well, the, the developing adolescent brain. It just, at how much and how often is so critical, you know, and, and how young. If you're 13 and you're using every day, all day, not a good thing. But if you're, if you're 16 or 17 and you use uh, marijuana at a party every now and again, hmm. There's just too much evidence that it, uh, all things equal, kids get through this, we'll get through it. Mm-hmm. So what underlies a lot of this too is the whole, in the drug war for decades, the kind of cry, we almost titled the talk this, is what about the children? I mean, that's been the issue. Is that That's the, the trump card as well as the scare about this. Um, and so now we have legalization first for medical use and then in growing number of states for what they call recreational use, but just overall use. Mm-hmm. What has been your take so far, the big concern in the fight now about the anti-legalizers is that this is going to make kid use skyrocket, et cetera, et cetera. So what's your take on this so far? Well, uh, my take is, is simply the surveys that have come, come out, even the most recent surveys, um, national surveys and, ca- and surveys in California, um, is that a teenage use of marijuana is just flat. It hasn't changed since legalization. Um, so that's, that's my take. Legalization hasn't made a difference in terms of kids using marijuana more. Kids who wanted to use marijuana before legalization, really, nobody has better access than kids and, and, and ever did. So, so I think um, I'm encouraged by the data. I'm encouraged by the data. I still think that the, there, there needs to be better education about cannabis and what it does. And I think the regulations and the... Uh, and what's happening in California, which frustrates a lot of people. It's, um, I hear from my friends who say, oh yeah, I went down to that store on Lombard Street. It's not cheap there. Marijuana's not cheap and there's the taxes and all that stuff. I say, well, how exactly did you think a, a brand new regulatory system from scratch was, was gonna get created? And that's, that's what the tax dollars are going for. You, you, can, you barely can get into those places if you're 21, let alone kids. What They are businesses. And these businesses do not want to get busted. They don't want to get busted. So they're, ve- they're very careful about um, not letting kids in. So. 
So there are businesses, and one of the counter arguments or fears has been about the tobaccoization of cannabis, that you end up with big marketing push, sneaky stuff. Um, so far, we have some regulations against advertising, but you know, if you walk around San Francisco now, it's everywhere. It's on the bus sides of buses, even. Oh, they had to and take them off the Yeah, buses. they did take them off the buses. That's right. Mm. Yeah, I took pictures of it before because I was like, wow, this yeah. is fascinating. Yeah, you yeah. Know? yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> but, I know. you know, there, that's out there. Do you have thoughts on the, you know, the best way to regulate this so that people are not being, it's not being pushed legally? Well, uh, to the adult market? Take your pick. Um, yeah, I think that I think you have to look separately. Uh-huh. I think I, the question is, can kids have? Are kid, do kids have access to the same places where adults get cannabis? I don't think they do. Right, but in terms of marketing, how do you separate? If you're going to market to adults, how do you keep that away from kids? Um. Or change it so it's not attractive to kids. I mean, that's what the menthol bands are about. Yeah. Adults should be able to, if they want to put weird flavors, strawberry, whatever, into their stuff, fine. But, you know, this has obviously been shown to be targeted well, you can, kids. But you can limit um, advertising the way mm-hmm. cigarettes are limited. So you, you favor the same kind of model, tobacco oh, yeah. regulations. Yeah. 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 I, I would. Mm. Um, what, what, is, me, what about differentiating between marijuana and um, THC products? I mean, the concentrates and edibles and, and, edibles and Yeah, so and, what about uh, edibles and concentrates as opposed to smoking stuff? Well, they're certainly available. You know, if you, if you go into a store, you can see that you, you know there's a range of them. A lot of people don't want to smoke. So they're either vaping or they're using a tincture or they're using uh, an, a, an edible, and there's many forms of edibles. I mean, it's just, it is really remarkable to me, the, the growth of, of, of products and, you know, that, are, that are available for different people. You know, um, the other thing is that the fastest growing market, and then there's the, the other issue, which I, my breadth of knowledge is not, that great on this. But then there's the THC versus CBD mm-hmm. and and the, the kind of therapeutic benefits of each one of those or both of them. Um, but the fastest growing market post-legalization isn't kids. It's, pe- it's people my age. Mm-hmm. It's people over 65. Um, who, of the legal market. Of the legal market, yeah. And first it, medical. And then now the legal markets, then now you don't have to bother with a, you know, getting a note or anything like that. So there's, I, I could use this example. There's a, a retirement community in Walnut Creek called Rossmore. And um, it's huge. It's a very, I don't know what the population is. 10,000 10, people there at Rossmore. And they have many clubs a great place to be if you're, you know, retired. Many clubs. The most popular club, by far, is the Cannabis Club. <laughs> That's the and the the meetings are well attended, and people are inter- They're not particularly interested in getting high, but they are interested in alleviating all the pain they have, and they're finding oh, this. Many of them haven't used marijuana ever. Or um, uh, if they have, it, they haven't used it in years and years and years, decades maybe, and they're, now they're discovering it. Um, I have some um, neighbors in my building who uh, have said to me when I moved in there, they said, you know, I know your issue. I know you're an advocate of legalization, but don't put me on your list. I'm not... A, a, you know, I'm not. I'm not an advocate of marijuana legalization. Okay, and then, oh no, several months later, it's one one neighbor who is so straight. I mean, I, you you know how I'm using that word. I'm not using it gay straight. I'm using like straight straight. He says to me, he says, uh, you know, he says my shoulder is really hurting me. And I said, uh, okay, I said, I know how you feel about marijuana, but maybe you want to try this 
lotion, CBD lotion I had. And he tries it and he says to me, I would like to have a case of that, please. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm, and I'm, and the other thing is, um, that what I think is also changing, which really has nothing to do with the kids here, but, uh, another neighbor who is, um, <laughs> I guess they they call them, um, VCs, but not the VC that, uh, that my reference was. They're venture capitalists, right? He says to me, this industry he says, I'm looking at this industry. So it, that's another way that people are, you know, kind of jumping into this thing. Um, so, but that, there, now we veered way off onto no, another no, thing. It's, it's all, you know, it's all really, I mean, because the legalization, it's how it impacts various sectors is fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking earlier today with some other people about north of here, which has been a cannabis economy for decades now. Mendocino, uh, Santa Sonoma, and certainly Humboldt County is really hurting because of this in a way, because there's overbuilding, overselling, the price is down, it's spread on the economy, there's less cash flowing around, there's just a lot of consolidation and related crime. So there's just many different impacts. But um, I want to ask you a little bit about, you You mentioned, so after, after the heroin project, you got into the researching of MDMA, ecstasy, and you and I co-chaired a big conference that was a fascinating experience in San Francisco uh, about this. That was a big, I mean, even here, but certainly all over the Bay Area, there was a big surge in this. Um, it was part of what people are now referring to as kind of the uh, resurgence of psychedelic medicine, if you call it medicine or not, but therapeutic use. Anyway, so that was a big uh, issue, recreational use. We had the same sort of perspectives about harm reduction, about that, um, what were if any long-term impacts, et cetera. But now it's actually, and, and our friend Rick Doblin from MAPS, the multi Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, is, has been successful in furthering the actual legitimate mainstream research of this for various, not just this drug, but others as well. Yeah, so the, if you were gonna capsulize what you learned during that whole project about XC, and it was actually published into a book, your project too, um, you know, what was it in terms of the, the harm-benefit ratio, as it were, about these, about those kind of drugs? Well, it was very interesting, this study we did, because we interviewed people who were from various um, uh, various groups. Yeah, and so I actually just, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is related to youth use too, because nowadays the generic term is more like Molly and things like that for a lot of these, these drugs, which are and always have been, as you mentioned in general, of questionable purity. I mean, when we monitored them in the hate, we found that most of what was, this is going back 20 years, but during the rave peak when it was everywhere, we found that most of what was being sold as XC was speed, because speed is much cheaper, and you can make a much bigger profit, and it has it has more harms related to it as well. Um, so anyway, so it is it's it's still there. These drugs are being spread around. I mean, if you talk to people who are a Burning Man and some of the big parties in the Bay Area, it may be the biggest use actually. This category of of party drugs, as they used to be called. So, well, what we found was that people went into MDMA use, two different uh, groups, basically, fundamentally, two different groups. Um, there were people who got into it to party, um, whether they were students or this whole contingent of people out of Dallas, Texas, were into it. Um, and then there were people who got into it for therapeutic reasons, even back then, especially back then. And some of it actually started out of some qualified therapists, psychiatrists and psychologists who had access and were trying it underground. And it very much mirrored the experience with LSD in the late 50s, early 60s, before that was made illegal, where there was an underground that was using it therapeutically and finding some very encouraging results with a lot of people. But then once it went public and people like Timothy Leary became 
famous for it. There was a big clampdown. It was made illegal. The same thing happened in the 80s with MDMA. With that yeah. But it, it, the, the people who went into it f- to party and the people who went into it, it for therapy, they, their experiences were so similar to each other. So the partiers found that, oh, my God, they were able to connect with people who they were with. They, there's a reason they call it the love drug, so you probably know. And um, so it turned out to be therapeutic for them. And the people who went into it for therapy, they had a pretty good time. They had a pretty good time, too. And so it just, the, the, the essence of that substance, it's just, it kind of, it's almost universal. And you rarely actually find people who didn't have a pretty profound and um, enjoyable experience with MDMA. Um, I think, what, so when I hear now people talking about using it for therapy, well, yeah, that was its roots. And it doesn't surprise me at all. So As long as they have access to the actual substance. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Then there's this whole um, issue of drug checking. Drug, they call it drug checking now, mm-hmm. drug testing. And that's not drug testing with your urine. It's drug testing um, with uh, the substance that you're actually taking. And there are kits available, and it's, that is so important. Yeah, I think we, that's another part of drug education. It was being done at some of the big raves back then, too, and you know, 20 years ago. They actually set up booths to, where you could test right there. You know. Yeah, but they started making those illegal. Yes, right. So um, let me just ask you one more, and then we can actually have some questions. I mean, you mentioned, I guess I want to, back to the, your program, you mentioned it being tested, rolled out, piloted in New York and then San Francisco. What does that mean? How do they do that? And how are they going to do that in San Francisco? Say, um, what is, how is it piloted? Well, we determine the sites, the, the schools. Um, some of, uh, you know, I'm arguing for schools that are diverse. And so you, you have, you, you, you're rolling out the curriculum and you have a pretest and a post test. And you, you're at basically asking the students before what how much they know and also um, it's mostly about knowledge it's it's not that much about um, um, uh, what they what they do because the course is only eight weeks so how much time between the beginning of the course and after but it's what we want is to find out if, if the kids learned anything what they learned and what their intentions are Mm-hmm. So that's the pilot. And what we found in, in the school that we, we tested in New York was that the kids knew a lot more about the various substances that they had before, and, they're in, and they understood the value of safety, and they understood what to do and what not to do. Mm-hmm. So Who was teaching it? The health teachers. These, this course is is within the health department in high school. It's not a standalone. Like D.A.R.E. is, people come in, their police officers come in. This isn't that. This is offered within the curriculum itself, which is also really good. So you're training the teachers first and then- Have to train the teachers. Does it involve a component, this has been popular throughout in a lot of programs where you teach students to teach each other? Does it use train the trainer kind of stuff like that? With- mm, ours doesn't. Yeah. Ours doesn't. But, you know, kids do, kids talk. Right. To each other, right? They do. And um, so, and the, especially the, 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 the fundamental harm reduction stuff, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, the recovery position, the calling 911. Yeah. Yeah. They were when I was when I was in high school, in junior high school, Southern California, nineteen seventies, drugs everywhere, and uh, they had a program. It was an offshoot of Dare. We had Dare come in for not Dare, but cops came. They burned pot in the room. You know, yeah. what does this smell like? And the, you know, we couldn't help but laugh because there, at that time there was a famous Cheech and Chong routine yeah. that where they did just that, and they asked, "Do you know what this is?" And they're going. 
Colombian, I think. <laughs> and they're arguing over, no, no, that's Thai. But um, they used, they had this program where they taught the kids to teach each other. And that was the place where you went, in my, in my schooling, that's where you went to learn about who had the best pot. You know, it became this almost like a distribution area for that, you know, so it backfired in a sense. And it was called Stamp Out Stupidity, and it was a big joke, you know. So Where was, were you? So it was down Laguna Beach. Oh, yeah, of you course. Know. Yeah. But um, it just you know, obviously didn't work as intended, so. Yeah. You know. So anyway, questions for Marcia, please go ahead. In your curriculum, I was really glad that you included caffeine and I didn't, uh, you know, the drinks and so forth. And I'm mm -hmm. sure I was addicted to caffeine in college, flying high, I had no idea I was on a drug. But, yeah. but also, um, there was not a mention of sugar. And I'm curious if in the we curriculum, do do sugar. there is information about the vitamin and mineral depletion and the effects, serious effects on the body from such things as. Mm. Caffeine, sugar, of course, alcohol has a lot of depletion effects too. Yeah. Um, um, on the well, it, we mostly focus on what it does to your mind, um, and of course, it's related to that. It is like the nervous system, and yeah, it's all, yeah. Yes. Um, I run a harm reduction class. I'd like to be able to be in your pilot to run the curriculum. Where are you? In Marin County. I run the Marin County Youth Court. About 70% of our cases are substance driven, and I do a 12 hour harm reduction class. Six of it with parents, and then two, three follow up two hour sessions with the kids. Um, it, it, the, the curriculum I failed to mention, we're launching it nationally um, uh, next month. And it's online. It's just online. You I download it. it. You can just take it and you know do That's what you generous. want with it. Thank you. I will. <laughs> it's free. Cool. So it's online now? It, it will be in October, early, October. Uh, late October. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we will. Now, yeah. what, we, what we'd like you to do with this is um, for you to let us know how it worked. Yeah. yeah. One thing we do that you hadn't mentioned is um, kids are each other's first responders. So we're training them to be effective first responders. That's true, huh? Yeah. And that's a good way to look at it. When you say first responder, you're referring to when, when they get up problems. to this mischief and somebody passes yeah. out. Yeah. Instead yeah. of them splitting and panicking, right. we teach them how to be a successful first responder, save mm -hmm. your friend's life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, what's going on in Marin County? In, oh, you, so many drugs. Well, so many drugs and sigh, and what does that mean? Yeah. I think high school is too late. Yeah. You think it's too late? Yeah. Even yeah. ninth grade? Oh, yeah. yes. I agree. Yeah. I'm going grade. to fifth grade. Yeah. Yeah. Fifth? Fifth grade. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, so I can just say I was a drug educator in San Francisco, both public and private schools for a time. It was after we did this big conference on drug education and all sorts of fascinating things happened and resulted in that, including the kicking out of the Scientology program called Narconon. That was a big thing that then spread nationwide. So that was, if, if it only did that, that was a big success because as it turned out, they had infiltrated everywhere and they were very bogus. But the interesting thing is we started at third grade with, with grade eight and third, fourth, fifth, and it was a, you know, obviously a different program each time when you talk to the kids just about you're starting at a very young it's just what is a drug that kind of thing it was almost like uh, go dog go you know or something like that by the time you got into <clears throat> junior high even they were clearly much more aware of things than their own parents often were and the other thing that I did when I was doing these was in it, one one condition about doing it was there was no teachers or adults in the room and I didn't know any of the kids' names, so I said, I'm not going to be able to, you know, rat you out or anything. You can say whatever you want. But the other was that there was actually a meeting with the parents, either before or after, like when they were coming early or after, where they could sit and ask me and see everything I had and tell them I wasn't going to be pushing drugs, but I was pushing something called harm reduction. 
And I never once got any negative feedback from parents until I, then I just got too old to be credible to kids. <laughs> <laughs> so I stopped doing it. You know, you need Throw to... Your hair. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> but anyway, so um, when you say too late in high school, yeah. when is right? What do you think? What do you guys think? I mean, I would say like fourth and fifth grade. Yeah. Yeah. Too late for what? I'm not sure. To start to with drug education. Start drug ed. Yeah. As yeah. A, and, and try and have any hope for effect. Yeah. I mean, you can educate any age group, but to make any kind of safety difference. Yeah. And with a harm reduction kind of a focus too. You know, I think that's harder at that age too. Is parents, some parents get a little baby G B. Yeah. 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 Well, I think well, our thinking was that we wanted to get in there in ninth grade um, because it, it, the drug issue is actually becoming real. Um, for fifth grade, even in ninth grade, they kind of look at you like, what are you talking about? Um, and I think it should continue through high school in some form of, of drug education, um, even if it's you know, groups that meet um, to talk about the issues. But um, that's another thing. It's, it's very rare when ki that kids have a chance to actually talk about how they're thinking about th this stuff, what they're worried about, without, without being afraid that they're going to get judged or in trouble. And so some safe space. Is 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 I think really really. We good. run that safe space every Thursday at the Superior Court. Parents aren't allowed in the room. There's mm -hmm. no judgment, and kids can talk about their issues openly with each other and support each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, my daughter is actually just started ninth grade, and um, we actually had. Um, one of the, some of the folks, I don't, I don't recognize you, but some of the folks came out to Lagunita School District uh, when she was in seventh grade at middle school with the, the, some peers from the teen court mm -hmm. program. Um, and that was helpful, but I, I would have to say, <clears throat> um, it seemed like, at least at her school, most everybody was not really doing much except for a few. And now she's really interested. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about it. But you can tell every she's, you know, it's it's around her. It's it's she's going from a small school to a large school, and you know we've done kind of what we can at this point, and we've tried to not give her her our war stories, but we've tried to be harm reduction focused. And hey, the longer you wait, the better your chances are. Um, but you know she's also in a really strange state, and, you know, she, mm -hmm. she doesn't listen to us half the time. So just, <laughs> That's not strange. That's normal. I, 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 I does. <laughs> well, see, I, the focus, right, when you talk, I agree about the youth thing, but the focus of the earliest stuff is, in my experience that works, is on the legal drugs that are everywhere and the advertising was everywhere. My parents' generation, 40% of people, of adults smoked. And in my community, 100% drank. Um, and so the advertising was everywhere too. And the focus that see that people, you know, underlying all of this is that kids, even more than adults, hate to be lied to. And if they find out that you're exaggerating or lying to them, you've lost them basically, because they're not gonna trust even the truth that you say. Mm -hmm. So you gotta be honest and upfront. And one of the things I kept telling people, I've told every, anybody is that, you know, the, this advertising, this, this tobacco advertising and this alcohol advertising, it's all about trying to take your money. You know, it's trying to get you hooked on something that, that will cost you money the rest of your life yeah. and make you sick eventually, but they don't care about the sick thing so much, you know, because it's too abstract and too far in the future, but about they're trying to con you, you know, to rip you off basically. And kids get that, you know, more than an argument about getting lung cancer or heart disease 40 years later, you know. You have a question. Um, well, I have a different concern a little bit. I'm, I don't have children, so I'm not struggling with that. But as a clinician, medical clinician, I mean, my challenges are with people who have 
conditions of all sorts and, and the whole toxic issue about drugs, not just recreational pharmaceuticals, but drugs in general. I guess I, I'm wondering if, if, as you thought about all that you've done with this, if, the, if embracing the larger world of, of substances, medical substances, I'm thinking primarily pharmaceuticals, but it can be, I mean, I mean just simple things, not simple, but, um, uh, well, it's a whole other conversation about DDT and, and but anyway, there, there's the whole toxic burden is such a big deal in terms of cl clinical reality that the, that the, I guess I'm I guess I'm I'm hoping that 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 the larger conversation of the burden of toxins is sort of embraced as a larger picture idea than merely the not to say merely to make them smaller or anything but that that they're but they're the idea of recreational pharmaceuticals as being the sort of centerpiece and, mm -hmm. and of course obviously that's a big deal and it's very important that what you're doing but it's it's there's it's, it lives in a larger world is what I'm trying to say mm -hmm. really and I'm just curious. As you do what you do, do you consider yourself, besides giving information, do you consider yourself obliged to, you know, to be more, to be active in the in the dis dis discussion and the description of the of the clinical consequences? I mean, how do you do that? I guess I maybe I wasn't listening carefully, but well, I don't know if there's how much of that is educating is drug education aging kids about that, except for the context of the pharmaceuticals abuse, which is increasing. Right. Um, but in the broader picture of the toxins, et cetera, I mean, you can look at one of our common wheel projects uh, that I actually co-founded 15 years ago, which is Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Right. And so healthandenvironment.org is a website that is basically devoted to what you're talking about, to research and reducing the impact of both environmental toxins, but of all kinds on our health. And so, and I guess I'm still sort of trying to say, as you're doing what you're doing in the drug policy area, is that a rightful is that a rightful place to have some sort of stake in the ground about the larger picture of toxins, or or does that is it just so just so to sort of other that you, that it doesn't really belong in the conversation that you're here today to talk about? Well, I don't know. I wouldn't. I mean, with Young people, including that in health education, might be confusing. <laughs> you know about that. I don't know. You know. But yeah, yeah. I'd refer them to you. It's an important issue. So. I, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, did kids see their parents taking their second alls or their 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 statins or their whatever it is? And those are drugs. Yeah. And as you know, mm -hmm. and and then it seems like the the, the commonality of the drug experience is uh, vast. Yes. And so the. Anyway, I don't know yeah, why they don't have to watch your parents. They just have to watch TV. Yeah, we're one of the few cultures that do producer to consumer direct advertising. Yes, that was a, that was a so big guess, mistake. Guess, We've actually tried to reverse that, even going th up to through the AMA, which is vastly opposed to this for various reasons, but also mainly because it's just marketing. You know, that's all it is, and it confuses the whole issue. But it's you know they get their way, big pharma. So, yeah. I just want to say, and I'm. I think that's a really important part of this whole thing. You you have some schools where 60% of the kids are on psychiatric meds. You have kids as young as three who are being prescribed psychiatric medications to control them. Mm -hmm. And and to to leave that out of the education, and, and a lot of people taking it don't don't they're not advised about the side effects mm -hmm. of the drugs that they're they're being given. At least that's my experience in talking with people about what they take. They just you know, the doctors don't sit them down and say these are the side effects that are possible and there's different layers, the, the ones in the beginning, the ones that may develop later, and that's just such a huge health issue. And yeah, the, yeah. And the, the diversion yeah. of these and use yeah. of people snorting their parents' stuff is, is a big issue, and it's, yeah. it's, it's, Joel. it's gone up and down. You know, I was very fortunate in that uh, I was raised by parents that, you know, taught me the most important thing that I could do is learn how to trust myself. Mm. And, but that meant really trust myself. Trust myself in the fact that if I find something is going to do me in, to stop. <laughs> and uh, I've passed this on to my kids, I think, with some verification, you know, that it worked. I feel very comfortable. 
And I think parents are afraid to do that. They're afraid to give kids the ultimate trust of themselves instead of, I know what's best for you. What you have to learn is you know what's best for you, really. Yeah. And, you know, and that's the learning curve. And, yeah. you know, it's not a panacea. Yeah. And mistakes can happen. Sometimes very bad mistakes can happen. But in the overall, I feel very fortunate. And I feel very content, you know, with the way my kids. But what I think, Marsh, and I agree, and I mean, that's, yeah. there's truth to that, is that you have, if you're going to trust yourself, you have to have a, a reality-based education of what the facts are sure. to know. And so that's what we're trying to agree right. on. But part yeah. of it yeah. is, you know, wanting to know what the facts are. Yes. Yeah. You Which know. is a problem in our culture right now, particularly. <laughs> <laughs> well, any, any, oh. yeah, I, and I, I think that so many parents, and here in, in Marin County, um, uh, there's there's a lot of substance use among teenagers. Um, it's a affluent place by and large, Marin, um, but parents are so fearful. They're generally fearful. They're fearful of the, what's going to happen if their kids use drugs, and they're fearful if they if their kids have friends and whose house they go over to their house, and they're more permissive. Um, about it, um, Marin passed um, was the one of the first mm -hmm. years social ago ordinance. social yeah. host, social host ordinance. ordinance. So I mean, this this to me, this got me on um, on uh, oh God on Fox um, <laughs> O'Reilly. I yeah I didn't want to do it, but. Uh, our media guy said, you, you have to do it. So here's, here's what happened. Oh, I don't know how many years ago. Um, in uh, Scarsdale, New York, very affluent community, um, a dentist and his wife had a teenage daughter. It was, um, it, it was either prom night or grad, or grad, grad night. And they knew the kids were going to be drinking. And so they said, okay, you, you st stay here. I'll take the keys, and nobody's driving. And, you, you know, you're here. And they had food and all that stuff. Next thing they know, they are getting arrested. The dentist and his wife are both arrested um, because they allowed underage, underage drinking in their house. And um, this also happened in a, another affluent community outside of Chicago. And then Marin passes this also host, social host laws. So it's a dilemma for parents. What are they going to do? If they know their kids are going to be drinking, it's grad night or it's prom night or whatever, and they just... They don't want them to, because driving, you know, passing out on your back is, is that's dangerous. And obviously, we all know about dr uh, drunk driving now. But, um, so what's a parent supposed to do? Um, are you enabling or are you keeping your kids safe? And that's, that's the dilemma. And Marin has been really strict about it here. And, um, it's, it's ironic to me because Marin County also, when you look at um, like the political stuff, Marin County, I, would they go for Prop 64? They, uh, yeah. it, 72. It, it, yeah, 72. One reports. of the biggest counties in the whole state. And yet, when it comes to the kids, uh-oh. So they're, they're, they're um, I don't think Marin County is embracing harm reduction. The way they, I think they should. Mm -hmm. They're they're still hoping for abstinence. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, Marcia, for coming. Here. Thank you.